Okay, Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to pick up reading with verse number 7. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 7. A message I've entitled, Faith and Patience. Faith and Patience. Anybody here been praying that God would grant them patience? We'd be sorry that you came this morning, baby. No, I'm just teasing. Faith and Patience, Hebrews 6, verse 7. The earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it, bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it's dressed, receives blessing from God. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we have persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany <coughs> salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward His name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiply, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Faith and patience. Now our text today is revealing something to <coughs> us about this Hebrew audience not before seen. But before we get to that, to further illustrate the extremely sharp point being made in chapter 6 here to the Hebrew audience, God, through the apostle, gives us a picture. Someone said that a picture is often worth a thousand words. I think it happens to fit here. The picture we're given here in verses 7 and 8 is a picture from nature, maybe even a little bit closer to home. It's a picture from the garden. Who here has a garden? Anybody? Okay, a few of you folks. Mostly fat people have gardens. I'm not talking about you, talking about me. Why is that? Well, because I like to eat. Yeah, it's not too hard to figure out. Picture number one. In fact, from this picture, we've got uh, we're looking at plants and two different kinds of plants, if you will. Plant number one in the garden. A vegetable plant. A vegetable plant. And this plant gets rain and it produces fruit for the gardener. And that's a good thing. By the way, uh, I didn't realize until this year that turtles like cucumbers. Did anybody else know that? I didn't. Uh, needless to say, we've had a few strong discussions uh, in my garden, me and the turtles. So far, I'm winning. So far. Plan number one produces fruit. The gardener is, reaps the benefit. This is a good thing. And obviously, to anybody with two eyes, this means it's been blessed by God. But in the same garden, there's another kind of a plant. Plan number two, they're weeds and thistles. And they get the same rain, and what they produce is briars and thorns for the gardener. This is a bad thing. 
Amen? amen. For those of you who don't know anything about gardens, you can just amen me because I'm asking you to amen me. <laughs> briars are not cool. The other day I grabbed hold of a great big handful of briars and thought, I've got my good heavy gloves on. I don't have anything to worry about. So I snatched the, the vines up out of the ground, thought, well, I took care of you, straightened my hand back out, and I had like 15 briars <laughs> stuck in the gloves that are now sticking me all together. Blessing? No, that won't fit there. This is bad for the gardener. And obviously, these weeds, briars, thorns, thistles, even according to the text here, they're rejected. Have you ever seen anybody with a bucket full of briars taking it to the house? That's what you do with your cucumbers and your tomatoes. Some of y'all are thinking, what in the world is he talking about? Just try it hard to understand, all right? Rejected. They're near to cursing. Now bear with me, and you who have a garden know what I'm talking about. Has anybody ever talked trash to the weeds in your garden? Now think with me. I don't know about you. We go to the hardware store early spring, buy all our little seedlings and our plants. I think this year we probably spent close to 50 bucks on stuff that's supposed to produce fruit. Okay, you get your soil ready, which is no easy matter, right? Get all the weeds out, you dig little holes or little trenches, you plant your seeds and you water them. Then you buy the miracle Grow, and you start mixing that up on a regular basis. That's another $10, $15. If you're like me, you get down on your knees and you pray, God, please bless this because I like this stuff real good. And you start waiting and waiting. Some of them start to perk up. Some of them start to lay over. And you go out and you talk to them and you beg them, please do right. Please bring me some tomatoes. I'd hate to go another month without a tomato. So anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, let another month or two pass. Your tomato plants have grown about yay much. And you got weeds. Weeds that are growing. Now, you haven't prayed for the weeds. You haven't watered the weeds, fertilized the weeds, or plant grown the, the weeds, but they come up. You know what I'm talking about? Now, I don't know about you, y'all, but I, I don't know when it happened. I guess whenever old age got me. But I am not impressed with weeds and vines in my garden, and I tell them as much. <coughs> and now, of course, we've had a wonderful crop, and I know that's why you came to church today to hear about my crop. I've got weeds out there, y'all, that are knee-high. Knee-high. I'm thinking to myself, what in the world? Well, I think the King James puts it well. They're near to cursing. Hey, their best days have already happened. Because as it continues, they're going to end up, the King James say, to be burned. i got a fire pit at my house. And anything that ain't right goes in the fire pit. I read through this and I thought, my soul, I've been living this sermon for three months in one Jesus. The good stuff produces fruit, makes me happy and knows that they're being blessed. The bad stuff gets plucked up, talked trash to, and thrown in the fire. And then it dawned on me. God's making a point here. Uh, this is in his own book. I mean, look at it this way. In the garden, which plant is better, the fruit producer or the briar? And don't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. In the garden, which is producing what the gardener is after? Right? In the garden, which is more pleasing to the gardener? Well, then the bear comes down the tree. How about in the kingdom of God? Which plant is better, the fruit producer or the briar? <clears throat> you say, could there be a briar in God's kingdom? You ever been around somebody that all you got to do is get close and they start pricking you? <laughs> You're thinking, what a blessing not to be around that person. We, we sing a song, a little chorus uh, every once in a while. I'm so glad I'm a part 
of the family of God. Everybody remember that one? Oh, what a lovely sentiment. I heard somebody singing one day, and I think it slipped out accidentally. I'm surprised you're a part of the family of God. In the kingdom of God, which plant is God after? The one that produces the fruit or the one that produces the briar? In the kingdom of God then, which plant are you? In the kingdom of God, which plant should you be? Wonder what God's fixing to say here, y'all. Fruit producers. That's what God wants out of the Hebrew audience, and that's what He wants out of you and me. When God goes out to His garden and looks down at you, what's He see? And that's a whole lot easier to deal with than when God goes out in his garden and looks down at me. <laughs> what does he say? Oh my goodness. Bottom line in the garden, you're either a fruit producer or you're a weed. <coughs> Go look in your garden. You know, they know, you, know, you say, well, I'm the turtle. <laughs> well, that means you're eating the fruit. You're worse than a weed. How about that one? And of course, in the kingdom of God, you're either a fruit producer or you're a weed. Don't you wish God would speak a little more clearly sometimes? Oh, I don't know how he can get any more clear than that. Anyway, Paul says then to the Hebrew audience, verse number 9. It's as if you can see him sit back for a minute. Uh, stretch. Uh, make sure that his audience is paying attention. And it's just, if, if he's saying, you'll excuse the paraphrase, listen, we know you. We're persuaded better things of you than thorns and briars, rejection and cursing and burning. We're persuaded things of you that accompany, or as the word literally means, that speak of salvation. We know you folks. So he says, let me reason with you. Now, even though you've shown signs of stubbornness and laziness, those of you who have been here for our study, uh, even though you've been showing these signs toward the Word of God, even though you try and give the impression of loving religion and loving the Bible, and you know so much about angels and Moses and Abraham, and yet are so obviously missing so much about Jesus the Messiah. And even though it's as if Paul is saying, I've been ringing your bell for five chapters. <laughs> Verse number 10, God is not unrighteous. God does not forget what you've done in the past. The things that you've done that speak of, that accompany, if you will, salvation about you. And what we're finding couched in the, uh, the text here, this thing we've not seen Paul allude to in this first six chapters of this book, is that this Hebrew audience had done in the past things that spoke of the real deal, of a real faith, of a genuine Christianity. Well, what had they done in the past? Verse number 10. Three things. They had worked, they had labored, and they had loved the saints. Be sure not miss that. They had worked, they had labored, they had loved the saints. Three key ingredients that speak of real Christianity. Work, labor, some of y'all are thinking, I ain't going to like this. Well, you may not. Work, labor, loving the saints does not save you. If I start working and start laboring and start loving the saints, can I go to heaven? No, no, no. That's not what saves anybody. But work, labor, and loving the saints is what a real saved person does. Okay? Just that simple. Number one, work. According to James 2.18, it shows your faith. I will show thee my faith by my works, says James the Apostle. How does that work? If you really believe that Jesus is the Christ and that He died for me because I needed Him to, then you are going to get up off your blessed assurance, make your way to an altar of some sort or another, and confess, I need you, I want to be your follower. You see, faith produces work. It shows it. 
It shows what you believe. <clears throat> I knocked on a door many years ago, canvassing a neighborhood. Man came to the door, expressed my reason for being there. He expressed his reason that he's going to speak thusly. I'd like for you to come join us at church. I'm a member of a church. Oh, well, that's nice. What church do you go to? Well, I don't remember the name of it, but it's up the road, turn so-and-so, and, -so and down a few yards, and that's the church I go to. I thought, oh, is that right? What's the preacher's name up there? Well, I'm not sure about that, but that's the church where I uh, am an attender and a member at. Little did he know that the church he just described was the church I was pastor of. <laughs> he could have been Elijah the prophet for all I know, because I would never seen him before. But he wanted to brag about the faith that he had. Y'all, if you've got real faith, it's going to produce work. You're going to do something about it. Amen. And then for the rest of you. That's what the text says. Thank God we got a text to work with. Number two, labor. Labor, according to 1 Corinthians 3.8, determines your reward. Reward? Yeah, reward. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Labor in the Lord is the real deal. We don't labor to try and get saved, but as saved people, we labor, and that's how God's going to decide what kind of rewards we get. Now you're saying, gosh, I didn't know God was going to give us rewards. Well, He is. It's in the Bible. And thank God for it. But what's going to determine that? Your labor. Labor? That, that kind of sounds like the guy on the job who does all the peon work. You got the guy with a white hard hat, and he sits around and gives orders. And you got the guy with a yellow hard hat, and he's the one they call the laborer. Anybody relate? Do they still do that? When I grew up, you know, there was like one chief and many little Indians on the job place. Can anybody relate? I'm supposedly a carpenter by trade. Stuart's thinking, yeah, I get all that. When I started doing carpentry work, you know the only tool I needed? A broom. <laughs> That's where you started doing grunt work, peon work. And uh, if you persisted, you may one day actually get a yellow hard hat, and then probably you'll never get a white. But labor, labor. Paul says, hey, I can remember you folks worked and you labored, but thirdly, you love the saints. Now, coincidentally, Jesus said, John 13, 35, loving the saints proves your discipleship. Work shows your faith. Labor determines your reward. Love proves your discipleship. Jesus said, by this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. <clears throat> now y'all, loving the unlovely is not the easiest thing coming down the pike. Anybody? Everybody in the church ain't lovely. Of course, I'm not talking about anybody here, right? <clears throat> But someone who brings the love out of you is not necessarily what you're going to find in God's church. Do I then get to choose who I'm going to treat good and who I'm not going to treat good? Not if you're a believer. Do I get to choose who I'm going to be committed to or not be committed to in God's house? Not if you're a real believer. You see, love of the saints proves that you're a disciple of Jesus. You can't stand the people in the church. Guess what? That says about you. Now you may find this hard to believe, but people are always complaining. Have all my ministry complain. Why don't you ever preach a feel-good sermon? I'm glad you didn't name it. You know, the feel-good comes in the last book. Okay? And if you ever want to have the feel good, you got to deal with what's going to make you feel good. Amen. Amen? Now, if this don't apply to you, take a nap. You ain't going to hurt my feelings. Folks do it all the time. 
But if you're not loving the brothers, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Well, I would love them, except I can't stand them. <laughs> well, I don't know what to tell you. The Hebrew audience had done these things in the past. And Paul points out for us here, God don't forget this. In fact, the word forget literally means to lose out of his mind. God never loses out, uh, loses anything out of his mind. You know why that is? Revelation 20, 12, God keeps books. God keeps books. If you've worked, if you've labored, if you've loved the saints, God's got that written down. And do you really believe that? Some folks are good bookkeepers, and then there are folks like me. Aren't you glad for people like Miss Shirley over there? Amen. Uh, they keep things very straight, very organized. Why? Because they just love paperwork? No. So that when you need to know something, they can put their finger on it, and there it is. God's even worse than Shirley. <laughs> He's got everything written down, y'all, that we've ever done. You say, even the bad? If it's not been brought to Christ... And if you've not asked forgiveness, pleaded the blood of Jesus over that, it's still in the book. God loses nothing out of his mind. God keeps good books. Paul says, listen, God, I never forgot nothing you've done. But looking at this group of people who've served God in the past, now they've developed some bad habits in the present, and who are in need of a few course adjustments for the future, God, through the Apostle Paul, says, verse 11 and 12, we desire, and I'm sure you noticed, four things. Four things to an audience. Now, listen, Paul could never be accused of almost saying something. You ever listen to a speech by someone and came out thinking, my, what eloquence. But what did he say? You wouldn't have that problem with Paul. He's been extremely direct, extremely straightforward. Why is that? Why well, he knows God never forgets anything. And these folks need to be right with God. So keeping that in mind, Paul says, and it's interesting to me, uh, in verse number 11, 12, the word desire, epithumeo, it means literally strong want. A strong longing. Paul says, there are four things that I'm strongly wishing, wanting, desiring for you. Number one, that every one of you show the same diligence that you had before. Number two, every one of you show that same diligence to the end. Number three, every one of you be not slothful anymore. And for every one of you, be followers of them who inherit the promises. Number one, every one of you show the same diligence as before. Let me just ask a couple of questions, and I'm asking them to me first. Why would a person not serve God anymore? Anybody here like made sandwiches? Yeah. Okay, one person. You ever been in a bad tomato? You ever been in a bad tomato and something in there looked out at you? <laughs> now that can tend to curb your appetite for a tomato sandwich. <laughs> God asked his people through Jeremiah, what have I ever done to turn you off? Didn't use those words. What did I ever do to upset you? Now, wives, can't you just imagine your husband saying that to you this afternoon? What did I ever do that disappointed you? <laughs> Write it down if you ever hear him say that. <laughs> Listen, y'all, why would someone not give God the best of their time, talents, and efforts anymore? I know why lost people don't, but it's because they're still lost. You say, well, that's a derogatory... Well, it may be, y'all, but it's what God said. Amen. And it's perfectly descriptive. Now, remember, God's so much higher than us. Uh, and the only way He can contrast it is His ways are in heaven and ours are beneath the earth. So He has to reach down and find ways to communicate things to us so that we can grasp these. Lost literally presents the picture of someone who does not know where he is. And because you don't know where you are, you don't know how to get where you need to go. 
and there's a great big chance if you're lost, you will never get where you need to go. So God says you're a lost person. Lost people have never served God. Lost persons have never given their time, talents, and effort to God. That's understandable. But why would someone who ever knew God not do that anymore? What's the answer to that? Have God's requirements changed? You know, they're very simple. We're to love God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. Whatever's left is up to you. Amen? I don't think you've got the pun intended there. If you're loving God with everything you are, there's nothing left. Has God's requirement changed? No, absolutely not. Has God ever mistreated anybody? Ever? Can I say that? No. Can you say that? But God can. Y'all, even to the, the most wicked reprobate that's ever lived, God still by His Spirit whispers, Come to me! All you do labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You don't have to do any penance. You don't have to pay a great price. You don't have to do anything but come and let Christ apply His merits to your account. And then you can be just as if you have never sinned before me. That's our God. Amen. What a wonder He is. Amen. Amen. Has God ever been unfaithful to you? Has there ever been a person alive that God left holding the bag? Never. There's nothing about God that's any less than absolute pinnacle. Like absolute man. And Paul says, look here, every one of you, show the same diligence that you had before. There is such a thing as inability. Okay? Now, I'm the perfect example. I cannot do now what I used to could do. One of the little grandchildren came in last night with these knee-high tennis shoes. You did catch that. <laughs> knee-high tennis I'm thinking, what, miracle grow on a converse? So I don't know. But if that weren't the ticket, he's got a zipper on it about that long up the side. I thought, ah! I wouldn't have to bend over and tie my shoes. I could find me a metal coat hanger, hook it in the zipper, <laughs> zip that dude up. I don't know how I'd get it off. Leave it off. I can't do it like I used to could do. <clears throat> it's a sight to behold, y'all, the way. Stuart, tune this out. If I gotta put some trim down on the floor and crawl around on my knees, I get out, I can put the trim up, <clears throat> and then when everybody leaves the room, I'll get up. <laughs> What a sight. My wife said in the dark she can hear me when I get out of bed. She can tell which limb I'm moving by the sound it has. <laughs> there is such a thing as inability. Y'all, and it's a reality. Uh, I was fixed to say about 88-year-old Alv over there, but he's still spry and he sling a hymn book over here and whack me if he wants to. There may be things that we cannot do someday that we've always done very well. Age, health, etc. But there's a great world of difference between inability and unwilling. Unwilling. Went to visit his old sister one time, church me, hey, you haven't been to church for eight months. I just thought I'd stop by and see if you were dead. <laughs> no, I, I can't do it like I once could. I appreciate you coming and see me. Come back whenever you will. Stop back by a few weeks later. She won't there. I thought, well, maybe she's dead now. Come to find out, a month or two passed. Well, where were you? What happened? Well, I went to Florida with my grandchildren. <laughs> I thought you couldn't make it to church. But the grandchildren asked me to come with them, so I went with them. I think to myself. Now, I know God's going to buy that. I don't even buy it. <laughs> Y'all, there's a big difference between enable and unwilling. Yeah. And the difference is God knows that difference. And we got people in our churches today, well, I can't do like I once could. No, I don't guess you can if you don't get up off the couch once in a while. <laughs> this time of year, we're always looking for workers in the churches. 
We need volunteers. Thank God we got volunteers and we got workers. Why is it we got to beg people to do something? According to the Word of God, your faith is exposed by your work. Well, I'm saved, but I don't want to work. Guess what, y'all? That don't mix. Oil and water? Uh-uh. No worky with faith. I don't work. Paul says, look here. I want you to do like you used to do. Now, something had changed these Hebrews. Their diligence toward God had dropped. Uh, we're not told exactly what the problem was. I can just guess, and that's all this is. I've noticed in my life, in others' lives, one thing that seems to take the diligence out of a believer quicker than anything else. Hard times. Hard times. Now this is going to be a deeply spiritual illustration, so y'all are going to have to reach up to grasp it. Anybody here know what a mosquito is? We had a mosquito in the bedroom some time ago. Totally uninvited. Buzzing around. You hear in that buzz, his radar, his sonar, his whatever, he's fixing to nail me. I thought, what do you do? You get up, chase him around the room, he's always faster than me. I thought, okay, I'm going to try one last thing. Went and got the vacuum clean. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, y'all. I don't like mosquitoes. Vacuum with a long thing. Turned the light on, I saw it. I thought, you're mine, Moss. Got that long thing up there, and real slowly I snuck up on that mosquito. And you know what I noticed? And I'm telling you the true story. The closer that nozzle got to that mosquito, I saw him tense up them with great long legs. And I'd wave it past him, and when it got to where the suction wanted, he'd tense it up. And he'd stretch out a little bit. And I'd bring the wand past him, and he'd ease back off. And I'd wave it again, and he'd tense back up. Now, y'all, I'm telling you this. Now, I did not stop and take sermon notes, except mentally. I did it for a little while. Tense up, let go. Tense up, let go. Tense up, let go. I let him rest for a minute. Hit it one last time. He won't ready. And he ended up in the bag. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This thing's starting to lose a little bit of its joy. What I see there is me. When I go through the hard times, I'll tense up and hang on. And then it'll ease off. And a little more hard time, and I'll tense up. And I'll hang in there. And that cycle can go on for a week or a month or five years. And then, when I'm not paying attention, when I'm coasting, relieved from my hard times, along comes the enemy, and bingo, I'm gone. I find myself almost like David on the screen just a few moments ago. God created me a new heart. I remember how I used to feel about you. I remember how I used to sing to you with passion. I remember, I remember, I remember, but it's not there. We're not told what happened to him. My guess is hard time. Paul's number one desire would show the same diligence as before and very closely related, obviously, desire number two, every one of you showed the same diligence to the end. Amen. To the end. Probably thinks it makes somebody mad here. Who here knows about Social Security? I know you don't want to raise your hand, let people know you're 65. <laughs> Social security benefits are determined by your last few years, I don't remember how many, of income or what they call contributions. Did you realize social security are contributions? Did you, you, you know the term euphemism? Contribution is what I decide. Not paying social security taxes puts you in jail. Everybody got the thing? And then on top of that, while we're on the subject of Social Security, ever notice these commercials about uh, uh, life insurance? And they tell you that Social Security benefits only pay $255 or whatever it is. Does everybody here realize Social Security is your money? It's my money? Y'all aren't agreeing with me. I don't care. I'm right. I'm the one been paying them cats for all these years. And if benefit, no, no, not benefit, payback. <laughs> we went to dive in the pool and go 
school. <laughs> anyway, your social security benefit determined by your last few years of contributions. Y'all, did you know that's real similar to the kingdom of God? Someone put it this way, show God your resume on Judgment Day probably won't work. <laughs> this is what I did. Ain't you proud of me, God? <laughs> and it's as if God would say, I'm not nearly as concerned about what you did as what you're doing. <laughs> Y'all, we've got to be faithful, diligent to the end. Now, God never forgets anything. Thank God for that. But quitting on God is not an option. Quitting on God. Others may not know you've done that. Others may not know I've done that. But God does. God knows when I quit. God knows when I put my foot down. Hey, that's all I'm doing. I'm tired. Someone put this thing this way one time. Did you ever know someone who's now remarried who celebrated the anniversary of their first marriage? Now think about that. I thought, I didn't just read that. And you, you married a second time and whatever happened, your, your first was still wandering around. Do you mark your anniversary on the calendar? No. Why is that? Because you quit. They quit. It's quit. Right? I mean, it's over. And besides that, Mama would blacken both of your eyes with one swat in your sleep. Then wake up and say something. What? I don't think so. No. How about this? You ever seen a house that's halfway painted for 10 years? I ain't talking about nobody. <laughs>
heard the thunder rolling the other, other morning. You say, which morning? Pick one. <laughs> <laughs> and just being foolish, quote unquote, I thought, you know, that may not be a thunderstorm. That may be the clouds fixing to roll up like a scroll. Mm -hmm. It may be it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. But one day it'll be. Amen. And in comparison, when that day comes, the 40, 50, 60, 70, 88 years that we've had, it's not even going to be comparable. Who here thought you'd ever be as old as you are? Who thought you'd ever go to places you've gone? But here you are. That's all past. The Bible says it's like a, a vapor that appeared and it's gone. How many of you have thought these little guys would be up here? There they are. Y'all. No quit. And one day, the old gospel song said, you'll be glad. I'm going to ask you to pray with me.